it's afternoon for you, it's evening for me, so good afternoon and thanks for coming along and thanks to Rosie and the Liberate Society for inviting me. So yeah, I've been involved in university research and educating since 1996 in America, in Britain and in Singapore. So I'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes about the state of higher education, mostly related to Britain, um, to address whether university is indeed fit for purpose. So I'll start with a bit of personal history. In 2008, uh, the Times Higher ran this story about the time an external examiner told me I must find the excellence. He told me to find the excellence because I was grading my third year module, in his opinion, rather too harshly. The story came about because I was talking about this exchange to a friend of the conference and was overheard by a reporter from the Times Higher. I was a bit reluctant to reveal the contents of a closed meeting. It's not the most professional thing to do, but she convinced me that if nobody talks about this stuff, then nothing changes. I agreed with her, so the interview and the story ran. The University of Birmingham, to be fair, took it pretty well. I wasn't reprimanded, um, but I also wasn't exactly supported. The story itself fell a bit dead and I sensed the writing on the wall and began casting about for a new position. I had a friend in Singapore at the time and they were advertising for positions. So I took a look at their numbers. The light blue bars are the first class degrees and they range from one to 2% in 2007 to 2009. The green bars are past degrees, unheard of in the UK since about the late eighties. Their passes range from 20 to 30% of degree classifications in 2007 to 2009. So in 2012, I interviewed and in 2013, I moved to Singapore. I probably should have seen what was coming. So this was my grade distribution for my first BioSciF module um, as I submitted it to the department. It was rather disliked by my head of department so I moved it. I'd been in this fight before, it hadn't exactly gone great. I didn't fancy another go. And in any case, I trusted that my new institution had to be doing something right to maintain first class degrees below 5%. Except if I'd have been paying attention since 2009, I might have already spotted some changes. So here's the distribution you've already seen. By 2013, when I moved, those first class degrees had already crept up towards 10% and first and two one degrees combined now accounted for almost half of all classifications. By 2018, they were at 75%. So in 2007, 2008, just under 2% of our students were awarded a first class degree. By 2017, 18, the number had increased to nearly 20% a tenfold increase. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the joys of um, technology and, you know, the, the Zoom world. But anyway, yeah, so um, I don't know how far I got, but, but our final degree classifications had shifted um, from roughly 25% receiving the highest two um, classifications in 2007-8 to roughly 25% receiving the lowest classifications in 2017-18. So in 10 years, we've completely reversed um, the distribution. So the National University of Singapore have achieved in a decade what the UK and the USA took about 30 to 50 years to achieve. Now, I'm not going to entertain the idea that students have become around 10 times smarter since 2007, 1990, 1960, whatever year you choose, depending on what country you focus on. I'm not going to entertain that idea because it really doesn't make any sense. Rampant grade inflation is the clearest evidence of degrading standards. The question there is, for is, is why is every higher education institution degrading standards? So one reason I think is the massification of higher education, an objective pursued by almost all countries for the past 30 years. Here you see the growth in higher education enrollment since 1970 in the US, Germany and the UK. Unfortunately, Singapore doesn't seem to have data logged with the excellent Our World and Data, 
But I can tell you that in 1970, just 3% of the population of Singapore were educated to degree level. Today, it is nearly 33%, and the projections are that it will hit, reach 50% by 2050. I struggle to think of a country that doesn't want more people to enter higher education. And on the surface, that is a laudable goal. Education has a strong record of opening up greater opportunities for people and for lifting them out of poverty. But increasingly, education is being used as the only weapon against poverty, and massification of higher education covers up for the absence of meaningful government policies to resolve social and economic disparities and address structural problems in economic and regional development. That might be forgivable if the massification of higher education was working, but it seems that it isn't. A blunt but important point is that massification of higher education has not delivered noticeable improvements in living standards. So this graph shows increasing student numbers in blue and changes in GDP in grey. You will be hard pressed to make an argument that the massification of HE has impacted GDP. The graph on the left shows the widening income gap in Singapore, more than doubling from 2000 to 2017. So massification of higher education here does not seem to be addressing inequality. On the right is the Gini index for the UK. Singapore has a notoriously high Gini index of around 46%, compared with around 35% for the UK, rising to 39% after housing costs. The Gini index measures inequality. Above 40% represents a big gap. Below 20% is an essentially equal society. The Gini index in the UK has not noticeably changed since it stopped going up at the end of the 80s. Neither Singapore nor the UK seem to have benefited from massification of HE by becoming more equal. Expansion of HE has not had a noticeable impact on economic growth and has failed to reverse growing inequality. How is it that massification of higher education has not impacted inequality? Well, one reason is that widening participation has merely meant that students from poorer backgrounds go to lower quality universities. So this graph shows the percentage of students from different income backgrounds attending the top third of higher education institutions by entry standards. Very few students from the lowest income brackets attend the higher quality institutions and there's been little change in the past 10 years. Those students entering the lower tier are also less likely to secure a professional job and they receive a lower starting salary even if they do. So this graph shows the percentage of students from each higher education sector entering a profession after graduating and the y-axis indicates the average starting salary from those positions. Clearly, those entering the lower tier of HE are far less likely to enter a profession, and they earn about £6,000 a year less, even if they do. This is part of the reason that the graduate premium is becoming less attractive. The graduate premium was once touted as worth £400,000 over a lifetime, but is now just £100,000, or £2,222 a year over a 45-year career. And that is an average. 20% of graduates will be worse off financially because they took a degree. Just over 10% of new graduates take their first job in retail, catering or bar work. The number rises to nearly 17% for psychology graduates and over 20% for biology graduates. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with working in retail or a bar if that is what you want. Higher education should not be reduced to economic gain. Here, Kurt Vonnegut reminds us that we have to live and the arts make life livable. It's not the job of university to make you a better barman by helping you perfect the pulling of a pint, but it is our job to expand your personal, cultural, intellectual and social horizons such that you might be a barman that people actually want to talk to and maybe buy some pints from. You should be educated for active and engaged citizenship. You should do a degree for the love of the subject and to crack yourself open intellectually. And if you're doing a degree for those reasons, then that is brilliant. 
But the truth is that very few students do that. And for obvious reasons, it is undeniable that the massification of HE has been overwhelmingly marketed to you as a means of improving your employability and increasing your income, which is the next big problem, marketization. The creation, especially after 2011, of a competitive market in HE, where universities compete for students and for research income. Marketization, hard to say, of higher education was expected to save government money and push educational quality higher. It has done neither. I'm not too concerned to enter into a lengthy debate of the financial issues. Suffice to say that the promised savings have not materialized. HE now costs more each year, largely because of gross underestimates of how much the student loan scheme would cost and unreasonable expectations of how students would select courses. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to, but governments wasting our money is nothing new. And appalling though that is, I am more concerned with the way marketization is undermining quality education. At one time, students competed to get into university. Now universities compete to recruit, retain, and satisfy student consumers. Governments seem to believe that students as consumers will pressurize HE institutions into providing an excellent education. But that assumes that students are both motivated to obtain and able to benefit from a rigorous education. The massification of HE and the pressure to, to get a degree for employment means that many students who are not very academically able enter university because they perceive themselves to have no other option. This is generating problems in some institutions that are more traditionally associated with school. Issues like bullying, excluding and picking on the students that do their assignments and who speak up in seminars, resentment towards coursework and assignments, and a general lack of respect towards lecturers and the university as an institution. It's grading time in Singapore, and I am receiving a stream of emails asking me to justify my grades. One student wrote that he thinks I might not be suitable to teach biopsych. The insolence is galling, but the most telling part of his comment is his idea that I should be teaching him like he is still at school. Marketing to student consumers shifts the emphasis away from education and towards the consumer experience. The job of the university moves away from educating and towards keeping the student consumer happy. Inevitably, we fail to either educate or to keep you happy. Your passage through university becomes mostly ceremonial rather than educational. Education is hard and doing it right takes an intense amount of work, study and failure. Students rarely arrive ready to write and able to write a decent essay. They need regular, difficult and challenging feedback on their written assignments. They aren't immediately able to put together a physics experiment. They can't necessarily build a bridge that doesn't fall down. They often think that the French Revolution was just about poverty and they don't understand the role of the Lenin levy in destroying the Russian Revolution. To learn, to really learn, students must fail and be told that they have missed many important things over and over again. Not many people spontaneously want to work really hard just to be told that they are still not there. So if we are trying to make students happy, then we simply can't educate. It's our job to cast doubt on everything, not to teach you what to think, but how to think. You need some people in your life whose job it is to tell you when you're not looking hard enough or properly. And when, you're uni when you enter university, that's us, the faculty, the lecturers. But we increasingly can't do our job. Rigor is not expected. Breadth is compromised for depth. Students are busy and overcommit, but they achieve little. The campus is a commercial space full of gyms, sports teams, cafes, bars, facilities, rather than an educational space. Universities have increased their capital spending 
from around £1 billion to £5 billion since 1995. <clears throat> Much of this has been debt facilitated, which has placed universities in a precarious financial position and has further emphasized the marketization of the HE sector, which now has to monetize the student consumer. Universities compete to attract students and then organize their institutions to keep the students busy and happy at the cost of academic standards. This is broadly bad for the university, but it is tremendously bad for you. Ultimately, not being challenged and being rewarded for just getting along is a difficult way to live. Even if you are smart, whatever that exactly means, you still need pressure to develop your intellectual curiosity, to learn how to think and to interrogate an idea. Very few are so truly committed to laziness that they don't want to be challenged. Most of us avoid challenges out of fear, but fear can only be dissipated by being challenged, left unchallenged, and the fear just grows. You need difficult and meaningful assignments and you need detailed feedback so that you can grow. Not growing means timidity, fear, and anxiety, things that seem somewhat pandemic on UK campuses. Another reason that students might feel anxious and distressed is because grade inflation means that achievement is increasingly dissociated from normal assessment standards, making it easier to obtain paper achievements higher grades, better degree classifications, whatever, doesn't necessarily lead to reduced stress or greater satisfaction. Once upon a time, student work was assessed based on the regular completion of essays with fierce feedback and high stakes projects that could end in failure, followed by final exams. Assessment was pressured for sure, but was it more stressful than the endless stream of low stakes quizzes, mini projects, short essays, participation points, and whatever other random bit of continuous assessment your lecturer might dream up? The myriad stream of assessment now means that students often don't know what is expected of them, can't really figure out if they are doing well, and don't know what it is that they need to do to improve except do more. That is stressful. It also encourages you to complain and gain the system for more points. Lecturers routinely drop the worst performing assessments, both for the whole class and for individuals. Students know this and ask for favors, which are often granted. The chopping and changing of assessments and the weight associated with each means that the final grade output that any student might receive for a module approaches random albeit with a hefty skew to the top end. Like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates, you never know what you are going to get, but you do know it will probably be nice, at least for a moment, because while mama might have said that life was like a box of chocolates, she might have also mentioned that too much chocolate is bad for you. The model of HE has shifted away from one based in student resilience to one based on faculty pity for the student. To say that a student has not put in sufficient work or isn't capable of producing work to a required level means saying that a student has failed a moral test, isn't strong enough or dedicated enough or isn't smart enough to obtain a grade. That's definitely a big statement, but to shy away from that and to make university easier to lower standards and make grades more obtainable means devaluing the student as a less able and a less responsible human being. That is the ascendancy of pity over respect. Respect is where you see all students as worthy of a rigorous education and all as capable as each other of coping with the rigor that involves so that they can be judged and separated on standards that mean something to them, to the university and to society more broadly. Respect means you insist the student take care of their own journey, take responsibility for maintaining their studies and for turning in good work that is worthy of their time and effort and worthy of someone else's time and effort in grading it. Pity is when you see a student and think they have no way to turn in good work 
that they need help in everything they do because they are hopeless. You pity people who you don't need. Yes, you, uh, you're breaking up there. Sorry, man. If you uh, rewind, just one minute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. How frustrating. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. So do you want me to repeat this slide or? Uh, no, just, just rewind one minute. Okay. All right. So, yes. Yeah, so I think I got up to the bit about, you know, pity. So, so pity is when you see a student and think they have no way to turn in good work, uh, that they need help in everything they do because they're basically hopeless. You pity people you don't really respect because you don't see them as capable of being responsible. And you maybe don't really see them as worthy of living a fulfilling and independent life. Pity writes people off, albeit with good intentions and some kindness. That seems to me a lot crueler, stressful and demoralizing than delivering an education worth having. It also means potentially delaying a day of more painful reckoning when important inadequacy is revealed in the future. Speaking of the future, I don't know what it will bring. I don't have brilliant ideas about how we fix the problem. There are a number of journalists and academics proposing various ways to repair HE. I do recommend that you read what they have to say. I'll make just one proposal. I do believe that every young person who can benefit from higher education and wants to enter higher education should be funded to do so. Providing such public funding might help restore the view of HE as a privilege, something you work hard at to benefit from, rather than as a service that you purchase or something you deserve just for turning up and putting in the time. But right now, I am interested in hearing what you think. I'd like to know if the way I've characterized your time in higher education, the instrumental nature of it, the school-like atmosphere, the somewhat endless and meaningless assessments and so on, match your experience whether you think university is fit for purpose and any proposals that you might have um, for the future of higher education. So that's all my formal stuff. Thanks for your kind attention. Sorry for all the mishaps. Our internet is struggling, obviously, and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, that was a really in-depth um, and informative talk. Um, actually, kind of touching upon something that I think um, all of us are feeling at the moment, especially um, with the COVID pandemic uh, and the way that, you know, learning has kind of gone online. Um, I think that personally, anyway, I feel like the issue that you're raising is even more pertinent uh, now. Um, with that being said, um, are we going to take any questions um, from anyone or come on, guys? <laughs> yes, Sam. I, I have. Um, <laughs> I first of all want to say I agree with you entirely. I think the commercialization of university has meant uh, degrees and specific classification of degrees have uh, become inflated and become not entirely worthless, but near it. Um, a third, a thirty-three students now get first in the UK, where a generation ago it was less than five percent, which means if you work hard to get a first you're now less likely to get money or the money or the status you deserve because you've got it first because so many people have it now. Uh, and in one sense, you could say that uh, university has benefited financially because of this. And you could say the university is taking perhaps money away from students in that way uh, by doing this, by inflating grades. But my real question to you is, if you were in charge of the university sector now as a minister or in charge, what would you specifically do to fix this situation? Yeah, so that's that's the question I was afraid of. Um, you know, it's like, how do you fix it? Because it, it's it, that's the, the million dollar question. Um, you know, I've been reading William Derezowitz's excellent sheep and he lambasts um, the American university system for many of the same problems I've raised today. Um, his solution seems to be to find a liberal arts um, university that will still give you a close contact with a faculty member, still keep you honest in terms of your reading and in terms of your scholarship. I think that's okay, but that's a very individualistic solution. And in the UK, you don't really have that option. There is nowhere to go. So one possibility is to have 
four new universities that are free institutions, one in each of the home nations, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, and those universities exist um, with a pot of public funding, but are otherwise not um, touched by government. Um, and students that go there um, are treated in, a, in an entirely new and different way. And I, you know, that might create a space where we can explore having um, a more rigorous approach to education um, for a certain layer of students that want to do it. Within the universities themselves, I think the one big thing we could do is try and put faculty back in charge. So we, we have come under the cosh of a layer of administration that only cares about marketing, that only cares about student satisfaction and doesn't seem to care at all about academic rigor um, and about um, the student educational um, experience. So I would advocate wrestling free um, from that system. Could it, could it also not be said um, that the inflation of vice chancellor's pay could be something to do with this whole situation. I would also like to say that um, since 2011, uh, the price of uh, university education has tripled. And along that time, the uh, vice chancellor's pay has also got, gone up and uh, education standards and teaching has not tripled. No, you're absolutely right. So um, while vice chancellor's pay have gone up, you know, in by enormous amounts, the real pay for, ed for lecturers has gone down. Um, we now have way more part-time lecturers than we've had before. We have a sort of semi-adjunct system. Um, so the staff-student ratios have not improved sufficiently um, and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I would cap VC pay um, at no more than five times um, the average lecturer salary um, at the university, which would still be an intense amount of money, more than the prime minister gets paid, but um, it'd be a lot less than what some of the pay packets are now. Um, and I would also make the vice chancellors have to return to the lecturing job um, at the end of a five year term, which would mean that they, you know, hopefully in, put in place strategies and policies that will benefit um, the university lecturing rather than benefit their CVs and allow them to move on to a more lucrative position. Okay, thank, uh, thanks so much um, for answering Sam's question. Um, I think we have a question from uh, Charlotte. Um, do you want to type the question or would you like to unmute yourself? I'll unmute, it's just because I don't have my camera on so I can't wave like Sam did. Um, Hi, I just want to say, first of all, like your talk was really interesting and I do agree with a lot of your points. Um, and you mentioned that these universities would be free, which I entirely agree with. I would wonder how you, so with my course, because I'm doing psychology, a lot of the readings that we have to do are written by people who have, you know, written for their peers and they're very hard to understand, especially, you know, I don't know, I just find it really hard to understand. And how would you address the discrepancies between those who have had an education where understanding those type of papers is a lot easier for those who haven't been able to have that kind of privilege? So can I can I ask how many people are in your lectures on average? Oh, like six hundred and fifty. Yeah. This year, and, and, my cohort's about six fifty. Right, and and how much time do you spend in a small group situation where you're discussing with a faculty member these papers that are hard to understand? Mm, basically, no time at all. No time at all. Yeah. So that that that's why you you've got no chance. Right. I mean, you're right. The, the papers are technical. They they are quite demanding. I don't. They can be understood, obviously, I'm proof of that. And um, I, but, but the way in which I came to understand them, at least in the first instance, was by having a small group discussion, six people um, with a faculty member, um, at least once, usually twice a week, and writing an essay about those papers three or four times at least um, every term. So you, we're not doing that. And that's, and that's exactly what I mean by you're not receiving an education. You, you're process through university is more ceremonial than it is educational. You're given lots of things to do, basically to keep you quiet and keep you busy um, until you get to the end and you say, have I got my two one now? And we go, yeah, there you go, off you go. That is, that is not an education that's worthy of you. And it's not an education that's worthy of the faculty either. 
And, and that is what we have to start pushing back against. And, and the free universities would be where people would get that experience. That would have to be what they were based on. Perfect, thank you so much. Sure. Um, Naris, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Rosie. Um, jumping on a bit from what Charlotte said, uh, do you think the issue might be also in the education before university? Because like I had to do a little bit of detour when I came to UK and to the access course in a, a vocational college. And it seemed to me like from the impression that um, most colleges and schools just want to get people into university, like uh, educate them enough to get the grades to get into university and university gonna solve their problems. Or uh, to me, it seems, like it's more of a flawed pipeline from the beginning. The uh, educational system, like from the grounds up, isn't meant to educate people. It's just like meant to get them the qualifications to get to the next step without like, it's not about teaching, it's about getting grades. And I think, uh, well, I agree with basically all of your criticism you said about university and the inflation of grades. Uh, but I, I, I see the route like going deeper, like it's the schools and colleges and what's ex expected of people. And well, taking a bit of a detour, uh, the educational system first emerged like with intent to ed educate factory workers, basically like um, academia was something more of a passion or pe for people who can put in the resources or resources can put in the people into like great minds that do discoveries. But educational system was first created to like educate factory workers to do like some basic stuff and to me, like it seems, it, it has kept that flair of like getting enough skills for you to like do a basic job, but like not educate you in more higher things. Uh, well, uh, do you think that uh, just getting rid of colleges and schools and like chopping up university into like you know, there's like a uh, foundation years university now. And a lot of people tell me like, it's just basically going through school again, maybe like university should be like divided into something like entry courses for university and like then proper university. So like to offer people, uh, I don't even know how to phrase it properly, uh, to not mislead people basically. Like yeah, if you I want to get I into Yeah, I, th I think I get your point. I mean, so I think you're, you're not wrong that the marketization has infected all the way down through um, the educational system. I mean, the, the I, you know, even schools compete with each other on league tables on, you know, the number of A's and A stars and, and, and how many students they get into university. And it's all about prestige and where you sit in a hierarchy, rather than about how you do education. And that's been encouraged by many, many changes in the way in which we do lower level education. That, that is a, a big problem. And I think it's connected to this larger problem I talked about right at the beginning that we don't have a very good social, economic, civic vision for what Britain should be. You know, like, like where are we going as a nation? What is it that we're trying to do? What are the new industries that are emerging? How are we going to educate and train people to put them into those um, industries? So I do think there has to be some joining up of the dots. I, I would disagree with your solution at the university end, I, mainly because I think that's really caving into the problem. Um, so we, we were discussing this in our department just a couple of days ago and somebody suggested that what we need to do is start streaming the students, you know, have, a, have an A stream, a B stream, a C stream, um, where you put the brighter kids or, or the ones that are more able in the top and the less. And that, that is really recreating the school system all the way up until you're basically in your mid 20s. That, that to me feels way too defeatist and not the right solution which doesn't mean that I, I know when I've got the right solution. Um, yeah, I sort of agree with you. Just like, I didn't mean uh, exactly like yeah. chopping up university streams. I just like meant more, maybe colleges and schools aren't as necessary as they seem. And like, maybe just like skip the middleman and uh, do a like a proper entry level university course. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you mean. I, I think part of the problem also is that we've lost um, the variation that we used to have in higher education. So, you know, the, getting rid of the polytechnics and turning everything into a university in 1992 
I must admit at that time, I thought, what's the problem? It's no big deal. You know, it's just, just a name. But actually, it, it was a problem and it was a big deal. Um, we moved um, institutions that weren't really quite ready to be in that sector, into that sector. And we created this second class tier. And it, and it would have been better to have maintained it as a tier where people are more vocational go. We also lost all of our technical colleges because they also wanted to become universities. So there's, there's almost no variation now in what you can do as an 18 year old. You either go to university or you go and do a job that's probably gonna be a total dead end. That, that's a disaster right there. And so rebooting higher education in terms of recreating further education for adults, recreating vocational pathways, recreating um, apprenticeships and what have you, all of that could help to start to resolve um, this problem. But yeah, that, that's tied to a bigger economic and social and civic vision of what we do. Yeah, thank you. You answered my question and I agree with you completely. Thanks. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, Sam, Sam's got his fingers up, I think. Sam? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, so I was, I've been pondering uh, this, what you've been talking about for a while and the solutions. Um, you, you, uh, I didn't know all the stuff you said, but I knew some of it. And um, I was thinking along the lines of perhaps having less universities. Um, it would seem to me since commercialization uh, of universities, uh, more universities have pop popped up. I went to a university a couple of years ago um, called Southampton Solent, which was an arts college before that. And to me had no right to call itself university in effect. So I was thinking perhaps um, having less universities around might um, create a situation where uh, the universities are more in charge instead of the students. I think that, that's what I'm trying to say. I was just wondering what you thought about that. I do think there's a case for um, reducing the number of universities. I think there are a lot of universities that are in a fairly precarious financial state and they probably shouldn't survive. I do think there's a case for cities that have multiple universities for some of them merging and forming um, you know, a, a larger unit. The, the one caution I would say is that I don't want to give the impression I think market forces can solve this problem. If all we do is say, we'll let the failing universities fail and do nothing else, then we'll only concentrate the problem in, a, in mega universities. The, the issue has to be solved through some changes in governance and vision of what education and university is for. Um, but yeah, I, I don't disagree that we have an intense number of, of institutions that, that we don't need probably that many. And how would you, well, how would one go around shutting it down? Would you just say you're not you're not good enough as a university, I'll, I'll shut you down. Like, it, it's quite a difficult uh, yeah, mysterious so debate I, there. I, I, I and, agree, how, yeah. and how many um, universities should be shut down? Should we shut down half of them or 75% of them? Yeah, um, no, I think, I think that's a, those are good questions. I, and I'm not going to pretend I can sit here and give you a list and, and work it out. And in fact, I would say that, that that would be the wrong approach. The last thing I want is, is a committee of experts that decide well, these, these ones aren't very good. These ones are good, so we'll keep them. No, they, we, it needs to be a much broader discussion and a much broader engagement than that. You know, we, we need to bring in um, basically the people um, and, and ask you know, the big questions about what it is that we want to happen in, in your area. So like, like Sheffield, I think, is, is going to lose um, their, their history department, is going to lose um, another one of their departments. and, and and they, within Sheffield, there's a number of universities that, that they could get together and discuss with the local community, what is it that you want from us? How can we serve your needs? Um, how can we serve the interests of the students? What are we for? You know, that, that kind of conversation, not, not just a government committee that says, look, um, we'll get rid of these five. No, that won't work. That'll just make the problem move around at, at best. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure what you're suggesting there, but no, me neither. It, yeah. seems, it seems reasonable. <laughs>
I guess what I'm um, suggesting I is that I, I can't solve this, and I don't think you can either. But I think the only way we can solve it is is that we have it have a broader civic conversation about what it is we're trying to do. And and I I would really genuinely argue that the faculty in British universities and and everywhere I've worked have been yeah. tremendously sidelined. Um, by the people who run the administration and run the marketing campaigns and run the admissions. And that, that should be reversed, that faculty should be put back in charge um, of running the institutions. That, that alone, I think, would make quite a big difference. The, what you've um, described here is what I, I and some others call the neoliberalization of um, institutions and um, the neo neoliberalization of things. And, um, is this something that you are against uh, quite often in other parts of society, not just in higher education, or is it just for higher education? No, I mean, I think That's it's- setting a, Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's a general problem. I mean, it, it is a, a serious issue. So the, the marketization of research is also, you know, ruins scholarship and rigor within research as well. So we, we do very quick, easy studies and that will have, um, you know, a sexy impact. Um, but we don't do the long distance, you know, difficult, rigorous, you know, longitudinal stuff because that doesn't get you as many rewards. So short termism, you know, league tables, um, fitting yourself within a hierarchy. They, these things are happening all over the place and they are poison. It was um, very interesting. I was um, speaking to a lecturer at my university um, about half a year ago. Um, he was lecturing uh, us about how uh, the higher education system has changed and how our country has changed. Um, before, we had something called the uh, British Amateur System, where we basically let um, creatives uh, have funding and do what they like and think of um, new things, new creations. And uh, nine out of ten times, uh, these new creations would amount to nothing. But the one out of 10 times it did would amount to something big like the internet or computers. And that's now being replaced with the, uh, what he calls the American, uh, I forgot what it's called now, the American commercialized system or corporate system, which has basically put short termism into the forefront, which has uh, made, uh, made somebody a lot of money, uh, but has meant that we're not getting innovation like we used to. I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that or? Um, I mean, I, it's funny, we, we were talking about this in our department the other day, but it, there is a, a certain lack of innovation and creativity that cuts across. And, and I think that's in, again, in part because there's so few opportunities you have to test out your own skill set and your own abilities. You know, you're, you're funneled into quite a narrow direction. You, you go and do a three-year degree or a four-year degree, or you don't. And there doesn't seem to be much else for you to do to write like, tests and try um, new things. So um, I don't know if I'm quite connecting with your question because I'm not exactly sure what, what precisely you're asking. But yeah, I think the, the, the problem cuts across lots of different things. It's not it's not just a university specific issue. Okay, I'll try and rephrase it then. The uh, commercial system we have now, uh, I believe and have been told uh, by a lecturer to be stifling innovation and creativity and many other things. And uh, you talk similarly about the commercial system we have in universities right now. Uh, I think stifling uh, other things uh, such as hard work or excellency or uh, the need to educate yourself properly. And I was just thinking maybe these two things are very connected. Yeah, I mean, there's a narrowness to everything. So you, you need returns and you need them now. Um, and there's no, there's no scope for, you know, going further, going deeper, spending the time to uncover things that, you know, you don't think of in the first couple of years. You know, I, I do think, yeah, that, that's a general problem. We're encouraged um, to do, you know, put out, put out a research paper every three months. Well, I can't do that, honestly, um, and it be innovative and creative. It just doesn't, no human being can do that. 
So we end up just fudging and pretending and even cheating and, and producing stuff that's not real. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's something that I'm obviously interested in. So um, I study biomedical science and, um, you know, when I was at secondary school and, you know, they were saying, oh, well, you need to choose your A-level um, subjects. Uh, and at the time, I was really interested in English law. I was interested in, in philosophy. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, in my brain, I was thinking, well, I can't, I can't choose those A-level subjects because, uh, you know, then I won't be able to do a science degree um, if I want to. Uh, and then what's going to happen at the end of that? I'm not going to get a job because in my opinion, and at the time I felt like I had been sold this false kind of uh, fallacy, if you will, that, um, you know, going into a degree like philosophy or law or uh, yeah even law to be honest um I wouldn't I wouldn't end up getting a, a well-paid job and if I was to go into a stem subject like biomedical science biology physics whatever you know I'd have a I'd have a job at the end of it and then I should go into that so I ended up finding myself being funneled into this group of people that were performing well in science um and ending up in a degree which I enjoy but at the moment it's not really something that I feel like stimulates me and I'm finding pleasure in in looking elsewhere um so yeah I mean it's just a, an interesting point um from a personal perspective to bring up yeah I mean I think you're raising one of the problems of the turning higher education to just a, a straightforward economic decision the government believes that by getting students to be a bit more consumerist and pay yeah. for their education that they would move rationally towards um, higher paying outputs you know like like stem subjects that lead to mm. better jobs um but that didn't really quite work because you know lo and behold students make decisions that the government don't expect them to so so there has been a funneling of pressuring an attempt to basically engineer this outcome i don't like any of it you know it's that like you don't go to university for a job you know that that to me there's been such a massive abdication of responsibility by industry if you want chemists if you want engineers if you want physicists you know to some extent you can train them yourselves you know if you want robot specialists then then you make some robot specialists mm. you know, it's like the idea that they, they can offload all that training and all that um, need onto the private onto the public sector is a bit of a con um, and it's you guys that suffer for it because if wanting to pursue something just for the love of it is becoming less and less something um, that's acceptable. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I think also, you know, added pressure um, with inflation, um, you know, even like house uh, pr uh, market uh, prices as well, you know, going up and up and, you know, income coming down. Now, I think, I mean, I think it's like, 34 or something 35 or 36 like is the age that people get onto the housing ladder now and that has like increased uh, <laughs> by the tenfold really you know people buying houses and you know now I think it just society as a whole you know that the kind of the system that we have um you know capitalism if you will I think it's kind of molded our brains to think in this one track mind as you're as you're referring to you know this job at the end I need the job I need the money um and it's and as you were saying you know it's ruining higher education um and yeah I mean as <laughs> it's not a straightforward solution is it um you know but it's an interesting observation that that the more you instrumentalize education you do you also create a potential problem that students will start to figure out that this isn't the best way um, as it doesn't pay, you know, it, yeah. it, the, the loss of four years of work um, isn't recouped by having a piece of paper at the end that says you've got a two one. Um, so students could start turning away. I do know that a few, at least a few tech companies are now starting to say we don't want graduates, you know, because mm. they're not they're not that smart. They're not that innovative. They're not that creative. Um, so we'll, we'll go for people who haven't been tainted by this process. Mm. If that catches on, that could have um, severe implications as well. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. It's interesting. Um, it is. It is two o'clock. Um, and I have said that this talk will last an hour. So if uh, anyone needs to leave, feel free. Um, 
but yeah um in any case um I do have to go because uh, I've got a seminar now so I uh, need to leave um but I just wanted to say thank you so much to it um for your talk it was um so interesting uh and something that I'm definitely gonna look into more um it interests me a lot uh so thank you You're um and yeah I'll see everyone later uh thanks for coming Nara are you okay to kind of carry on the conversation okay cool yeah. all right see everyone later bye 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 bye, bye. um yeah, Stuart, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I think the timing is a bit unfortunate because of the time zones, because I think a lot of our members would have showed up. And uh, this has been also something we discussed a lot uh, lately, like uh, how, how, like, what's the point of education? Where, like, what's the end goal of education? Where should it go? How we should change it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, do you think university still does things right? I mean, on the whole, no. Uh, that, that's that's the truth of it. You know, I mean, we, we don't we don't educate in a way that is good for you and, and good for society in general. We don't even we can't even argue that our research is doing well. You know, the, the replication crisis is obviously huge in psychology, but actually, it, it cuts all the way through. Even physics is facing a, a real problem. Um, so we that. The, the, the marketization um, has undermined academic rigor, scholarship, research rigor, you know, all of it. it. It's all starting to suffer. I don't know where it ends. I don't know how, you know, the implosion occurs. I don't know, you know, what happens exactly. But the model that we've created is, 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 is clearly a broken model. And, and the, the, I don't want to fetishize great inflation because it's not, that's not the point. But it illustrates so clearly that something has gone horribly wrong, where in a 25 year period, we've gone from having a small percentage of first class degrees to having almost 25%, a tenfold increase. And it just doesn't make any sense. And the fact that we can't even honestly discuss that and say it out loud, this doesn't make any sense, shows how deep the rock goes. The faculty will argue, no, no, students have gotten better. They're smarter now and it's like, I, I can't take you seriously as a human being. You're trying to tell me that we've got 10 times the number of smart people than just a couple of decades ago. That would be a miracle in human evolution. Um, well, before going to uni, I had the chance to work in a corporate environment. And uh, I talked with some HR people about like the value of degrees. And basically the answer to me was, as long as you have one, it doesn't really matter unless it's very technical. Uh, and uh, if you want to get a higher salary, like you should do a master's, for example. And it seems like that grade for some, like uh, showing that you're interested in the, uh, well, the subject and you want to put in extra effort that has moved from the first to a master's or a PhD. It's like in, like in the industries I'm interested in when finishing, like uh, data science, for example, like a lot of people are telling like uh, a master's or a PhD is like uh, showing that uh, extra step, extra effort, extra knowledge, like you would otherwise get in a first in a degree before. Like, I, I don't quite agree with that, but it seems that window of uh, like uh, where the grade is at is like moving upwards. And at the same time, PhD students are underpaid uh, over like overused by universities to teach other people. And it feels like it's, it's just killing the passion in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, you raise a, another another interesting point there, which is that we're also suffering from seriously lazy um, hiring policies and HR departments because they they will just use the degree as a way of um, filtering out um, their applicant pool, and and you know, now you need a degree to do jobs that you just don't need a degree to do. And the only reason that they need a degree is because HR said, well, that cuts down our applications by 50% or whatever. And, and, and that's, that's unconscionable. It just doesn't make, it's just not right. And getting rid of these um, false needs would be useful, false demands. Um, is, does anyone have any questions? Um, okay. Um, well, I have like a, 
do you have a let's say a survival guide for students like how do you go to university and still make most out of it uh, yeah you've got to fight your institution to get an education that that's the truth of it so the, the, the lady who asked the question earlier about you know the difficulty of writing psych really reading psychology papers she's disappeared unfortunately but you know she's that's a very clear example of the problems that you face as an undergraduate you're in a C um, and being seen and being heard is very difficult in that C. Um, what I the only hope I can give you is that there are still a, a large number of faculty members who are interested in the student body and, and if you do have something that you want to discuss and you can you know pitch it in a way that is interesting and, and you know articulate and, and not needy and demanding then it's a very good chance that you can still have the kinds of conversations that you would have had um, in the past more naturally. So you've got to you've got to fight and wiggle your education out of the institution, get your degree despite um, the university's efforts to keep you distracted mm -hmm. and away from the faculty and away from anything useful. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I do some peer assisted tutoring for my department and it's like it's nice to see some very passionate people about their subject and how they're fighting against like the requirements of uh, the grades and like the topics and well I agree with you uh, the uh, if you want to get most out of the uni at the moment it's sort of a fighting against the uni a bit like trying to uh, wiggle out uh, the benefits with all the knowledge and like get that extra what you came for yourself not expecting to be spoon fed to you so I think and Lucy's put an interesting point in the, in the chat. So um, students are performing better because the economic stakes are so much higher than before. Well, I mean, it, economic stakes in and of themselves won't make you um, perform better. All, all that really is is that a fear that if you don't get um, a decent grade, i.e. a 2-1 or a 1st, um, you'll have wasted your time um, at university. Um, but that, that in and of itself doesn't mean that you're going to do the kind of work that's necessary um, to get a decent education. To some extent, you, you can't unless your institution works with you. So students are definitely busy. Um, they're definitely paddling furiously. I, I don't doubt that. They definitely have a lot of things to do, a lot of assignments. But whether they're delivering you the value that, that you need, whether they're giving you an insight into who you are as a human being, whether they're developing your a deep understanding of your um, area of study, that's very debatable. Um, so I, I, I take your point that, that having a degree is, is now almost a necessity. Um, if you don't have a degree, you, you get cut out of an awful lot of job opportunities. But in and of itself, that, that won't make um, your educational experience um, good or valuable. I, Lucy, I hope that addressed your question. Like, if anyone else has any questions, uh, raise them now because I think uh, people are dropping off. Yeah, sure, Sam, go for it. Um, so, if you were to restructure the uh, grading um, grading structure, how would you do it? Would you go back to the first two one two two three, or would you create an entirely different grading structure in and of itself? Yeah, so again, that, that, that's a, a technical solution to a problem that's not really technical. So the, the grading structure doesn't really matter. Um, what, what matters is whether or not we are properly assessing your work and giving you grades that will genuinely reflect the value of your work and will serve to inform you of what it is you need to do. So I don't, I don't know how it is over there, but, but for me, I really can't grade um, anywhere below a B minus. It's pretty much impossible now. Um, so I'm graded in a very, very narrow band. And that means that I can't really genuinely tell a student this work is just not good enough. You know, you, you've got to change. Um, and, and also our students can get rid of modules that, that don't come up to a high enough grade point for them. They can discount them. I don't know if you, you guys can do that as well. Um, lecturers will often discount um, the lower grade points. So it, it, it's not about changing the grading structure is what I'm saying. It's about delivering honest feedback and honest grades. And we, we can only do that by fighting the institutions because the institutions tell us 
you're a bad educator if your average grade for your module isn't at least a two one. Which you think about it, it's just completely insane. I mean, if you want to guarantee grade inflation, that's the way to do it. You know, I'm a bad educator if you don't all get A's. Oh, well, you all have A's. Congratulations. But th th that's the thing with uh, schools is uh, they don't have the um, lower education system doesn't have so much grade inflation because they have uh, independent bodies yeah. uh, and independent examiners. But it's uh, it's a bit like giving saying the school saying to the school uh, giving the school power give all their students A's. It's what the university has. Yeah. And of course, they no, give all their A's because it puts them all into higher employment uh, or better employment, and therefore they will get be um, better reviews and they will get more money. Yeah. Uh, no. That's the system we're currently in. You're right. I mean, the, the, the one strength that the, the, the school sector has is that um, because the exams are set independently and marked independently, um, they can't just inflate their students' grades. Of course, this year, thanks to COVID, that's exactly what did happen. And, and I worry that that might now filter into the system more broadly. There's no incentive at all, really, for an educator um, to not give the students high grades, except their own dedication to their profession. That's it. Your own moral compass is the only thing. And it's not enough. We're, we're, we're too individuated and we're, we're, we're too corroded for that to work. Well, it's also not enough because you might get fired because of it. It's also true. Yeah. You're not wrong. Do you think the pandemic might be the push that will make the education system change? Because it's, it, like, it feels like it's highlighting a lot of the issues that were like somewhere happening on, on the backside. Like, uh, well, from my experience now, students just can't engage with the material online as they did in person. Like students don't follow it as much. And there are issues like just cropping up everywhere and it could be the pandemic, the push that will require some reorganization and some change in this education system. Yeah, but unless that reorganization comes from some sort of um, push from below, either from students or from faculty, um, then it will just be more of the same. It's gonna go in the same direction. And you know, your, your courses will go online, you'll have less face-to-face -face time. Um, you'll have more assessments that are done at a distance that have, you know, less feedback, less input from faculty, less of the things that you really need to guarantee a good education, because those things are expensive and time consuming. We can't teach a thousand people at once if everybody submits a 1500 word essay every week, not without at least, you know, 200 faculty members running that course. Yeah, well, uh... I for one agree with you completely. <laughs> I, and at the same time, I, I just don't see what could exactly change without being very radical. Yeah, um, no, I, I do agree with that too. And that's what makes it feel a bit futile and a bit depressing. Well, let's hope there's something better for us at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, we just have to keep pointing to the problem at least. That, that's, that's the minimum requirement. Uh, well, from my experience with academics, like usually the ones who are most vocal about why the system doesn't work are the ones who are more interesting to talk about topics who like push you in the direction that yes. exposes you to something. And uh, like, I, I, I deeply appreciate people like you that highlight those kinds of issues and are ready to come up for uh, like, like student uh, society events like this. And uh, well, uh, Liberate Debate thanks you a lot for offering us your time and your, and your opinion. I think it was invaluable. Sure, you're very welcome. Thanks, guys. Well, good luck with everything. Okay, thank you. So we're going to end this session, I think, now, because a lot of people have dropped off. Like, I could continue talking with you, but I guess, <laughs> like, we should we should probably re reserve you for another talk somewhere sometime soon, <laughs> if that's possible. Yeah, and happy. so um, for people that are watching this recording online, we have Wednesday sessions at the moment online. Uh, so each Wednesday, uh, 9, 7 p.m., on Discord, uh, join for an in some interesting topics. And we have frequent guest talks like uh, with Stuart here. Uh, so follow our Facebook for links for them. And uh, thank you, Stuart, for your time. And thank you for, for people who came to, get to this event and for people who are watching this online.